Perfect. Uh, hi, can you hear me? No? Uh, now? Oh. <laughs> okay, there's too many people here. I'm starting to get nervous. <laughs> okay, welcome. This session is going to be about, well, about the search for approval, I guess. Approval that we are doing stuff properly. So there is this thing like best practice. What is, what is best practice and do best practices exist at all? So it is a big question. So if I'm doing something, am I doing it right? Who can tell me? Is there a book on that? I know. But before we begin, I would like to say thanks to the guys who made, well, this happen. Thanks, sponsors. And hi, I'm Branislav. I'm a web developer and a Drupal guy. And I've been in Drupal world for 10 years, more than 10 years. First period of the time I was an amateur. I actually, well, studied medicine. This is me, really. And yeah, it, it was a totally different world. And I was a med student with substantial IT knowledge. And I hated medicine. So I decided to become a web developer with substantial medical knowledge, which is kind of awesome. So first I was a site builder. Then I was a front ender. Finally, full stack Drupal guy. And here I am today with you. Up until four months ago, I lived in beautiful city of Pancho uh, in Serbia. It is a quite little town uh, around 16 kilometers from the capital of Serbia. But four months ago, I moved to Rheinbach, Germany, which is also a quite little town, nice town near the ex capital, Bonn. I'm working for a company called uh, Union Betriebs GmbH. Um, a full-spectrum digital ag agency providing IT, internet, uh, printing house, letter shop, uh, and publishing house. And I'm working on a team in a team uh, which does symphony projects and Drupal projects for the largest German political party. Why was I talking about this? Because you know I handle a lot of change these uh, these well maybe last couple of years. And I learned to live with change management. So personally, uh, I find like the biggest change, not in moving and everything, but also in switching from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, which is like, that, that's my profession. So, and I notice that the concept of change is really the same. You know, whether you're like moving from one profession to another or one city to another, and even if you're like moving from one CMS or one version of CMS to the, another, the, the real thing is about embracing changes while keeping your identity, keeping your knowledge like constant, fluid. So Drupal 8 gave us 200 new features, uh, new APIs, uh, totally new object-oriented way of doing stuff. A new paradigm built somewhere, probably built somewhere else. Twig. So this entire Drupal ecosystem just screams revolution, change everything, and start from the scratch. And I hated the process because you know I spent 10 years learning the damn thing, and it's it's really terrible. I mean, now now I have to forget everything and start over. And I, I couldn't really you know, I couldn't really live with it. So uh, I decided to start from, from like fundamentals. What do we want to keep? And we want to keep the goal. And the goal is actually, you know, good software design. It's all about building functional, robust, measurable, debuggable, maintainable, deployable, extendable, reusable software. So the goal haven't changed. We want to do it, and we want to do it fast because you know, turn around, new projects, money. That's what we, what we want to make. 
So in, in programming world, speaking strictly about you know, coding stuff, we have design patterns. And design patterns are a kind of a way to keep us you know, focused on those goals and help us like, deliver things without really, without really too much troubles, without, you know, without questioning ourselves, is this OK? And also, design patterns have this fantastic you know, thing. They, are, they have a name, and they, they have context. So, if I say I want to implement strategy pattern here, and you know every every developer around knows what I want to do, and they can tell me you know you already did, you don't use that there or you're not. So it's kind of standardized, but it's also well documented. It's you have millions of books, and this is only the beginning. Uh, and in site building, generally we have this problem about. Uh, okay, we could, in theory, use design patterns as guidelines in site building, but it would be really impractical, I guess. So, in site building, we have best practices. And the same as, as uh, design, uh, design patterns, best practices are suggestions. You don't, well, have to do it like that. We just suggest you take this approach. Uh, but in comparison with, with uh, design patterns, which are like uh, uniform for every programming language, for every, every single application, um, best practices are framework specific. But not only framework specific, like we have Drupal best practices, but we have Drupal 7 best practices. And it's, and it's really, I don't know, it's. It's really hard to document it. It's really hard to make a classification of best practices. And finally, I believe we don't have any literature on that. So, and yeah, we question best practices all the time. Is this the best practice? You know, to me, it sounds like a stupid thing. I know. So let's start with the, uh, well, trying to analyze existing best, well, best practices or practices or whatever and see what is going to work in Drupal 8 and what is not. And finally, try to, try to question them and evolve them or even ditch them totally. So the biggest, the darkest of all dark magic in Drupal Realm is deployment. And well, I'm not really talking about all the deployment because code deployment was fixed with Git. We don't care about it. I'm, of course, talking about config de deployment. Uh, the basic idea about config deployment is that you, know, we, you need to move your clicks and your settings and your keystrokes from the database to the Git so that you can like, commit and move and get over with it. And, you know, deploy it in life. Uh, but how do you do it? Uh, generally, the concept of uh, manual deployment is, of course, total failure. Uh, it's prone to errors. It's slow. Uh, it takes a lot of you know, highly qualified developer hours to, to repeat clicks in uh, dev in staging, in live server, in some third, fourth server, etc., etc. But still, a lot of companies are doing this. So I don't know, who does here manual deployment? <laughs> OK, everybody's shy. I'm doing manual deployment. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not proud. <laughs> yeah, thing is, thing is, uh, Managers hate all the overhead that cannot really be shown to, to clients. And that's normal. And, you know, testing. Who is going to pay me to do tests? Who is going to pay me to do like this, this automated deployment and testing thing? 
So, and especially when we are talking about small things like change the title or something or, of the field or add the field, it's easier, it's more convenient to do it manually. But then again, it's prone to errors. <laughs> so, we invented some processes in Drupal 7 world that is going to help us do the, do the deployment. So, first thing I could think of is hook update 10, which is who uses hook up the end process to, to move their stuff to? Okay, okay, awesome, awesome. I thought it was historical. <laughs> okay, so uh, basically the idea about hook up the then, uh, more most of you know, uh, is uh, to write your stuff in your install files and then just run the update uh, of the, of the yeah, those custom modules containing all those all those settings, and you would update from from uh, install file in database of local environment. You would make sure everything works. Then you would commit. You would test the thing in in uh, staging environment and live environment, and it works or not. And it's great because you have full control over the process. Uh, you know what you wrote in the code. You can, you can debug it easily. When you're doing deployment of this, of this thing, it already tr you already tried deployment in, in staging environment. It, it worked. Uh, and deployment is really about running update PHP, which is fast. Um, comparing to previous example, where if you had like some really s serious setting deployment, it would take a lot of time. And during the process, it would result in server instability. Uh, it would result in, well, what if you screwed up something while deploying manually in live server and the entire live server is dead? And then clients started calling your, your uh, managers and managers started calling you and it's, it's uh, I hate it. Who had that? Who experienced that? Yeah, it's, it's bad. Okay, so, but let's hook, that, hook up the 10. It's, it's great, but we have a problem with that. You need to code a lot. And yeah, we are developers who don't like to code a lot because we are Drupal developers. So <laughs> we have this features module, which kind of solved our, our problem of deploying, deploying stuff properly, but without, without too much development and with, with some clicks. Who uses features? Awesome, awesome, I hate features. <laughs> who hates features? Yeah, about the same number of people who use it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, so features actually solved our problem. And I want to talk about the workflow of the features because you already know it. And you, know, of course, know that it is not all lollipops and unicorns. <laughs> so our biggest problem with features is the fact that Drupal 7 handles stuff using auto-increment in indexes. You created a block. That block is going to get a number. That number is, is totally predictable. So we don't want that because uh, those numbers could be out of sync from in, in your dev environment, in your staging environment. And so we are using this module called Features Extra. Who uses Features Extra? Who hates Features Extra? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it helps us with that. It introduced unique uh, IDs and everything. So it kind of solved the problem, but still, Drupal 7 is broken in the core. And that, that, that makes a lot of problems with features and everything. And we hate fe features, but we should really hate Drupal 7. <laughs> <laughs> so next problem uh, happened with, with this Entire recreate revert terminology. So, who tried explaining to like noobs, people who don't really know what feature is, what is revert and what is recreate, and what is import and export here? I now, maybe I'm confused because of the because of the crowd, but I really try and truly remember what which is what. Then yeah, it doesn't work. So, terminology is broken, uh, and yeah, it's it's bad. And finally, who tried disabling feature on live? <laughs> okay, so another bad idea. You disable the feature, it will, it will delete all the settings, which is kind of something you wanted, but if that's a content type and you actually have data, you know, it is all going to be gone. 
So uh, um, the company I'm working here, uh, currently in does all the deployment manually. All the deployment, no matter how difficult it is, we are going to do it manually. And my boss really insists on that. Why? Because they tried features, and in live site they didn't back up. They actually deleted some really important data. But you know, um, conclusion of the story should be do the backup, not not don't do the features. Anyways, anyways, that's my problem. That's that's really big psychological problem I'm having currently. <laughs> So, but, but next thing with features is that uh, you end up with these kinds of screens. Uh, so this is actually from a live site, from a re really well-visited live site. Uh, and those are our features. Some features are overridden, but we are not really sure if good settings are in code or in... Uh, in, in, in database. So we need to review that. And we're using diff module for that because we are like smart people. But still, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. Then you have this needs review, and I have no idea what that means. <laughs> and finally, you have this delete me group over there. And that delete me group is like all the features we cannot really disable. We want to, but we cannot. So we, we, just, we just move them there. <laughs> sometimes, I don't know, sometimes it is going to be gone. <laughs> so it's a mess. And, and finally, that's, that's not the biggest problem with features. The biggest problem with features is generally, so imagine a situation, and really simple situation, everybody had this. You have a content type, and you are using it like standard body field, you know, and you created a feature. That feature is going to have field base and field implementation or instance. And then clients require the new content type called, let's say, listing. So listing actually has the same body field, but, well, it is the same body field, unfortunately. And it is only a field instance. And because it is a field instance, it requires article as, as dependency, which made this, this thing like, OK. So, but we have a really creative client. And really creative client wants to have a list of all listings or some listings, related listings, in articles, like entity reference thing, like all the referenced advertisements in articles. So we created uh, entity reference to listing nodes, and we created circular, circular dependency. Who had experience with circular dependencies? Who hates them? <laughs> OK, but this is only a simple example, and you can solve that. Uh, these circular dependencies can get huge. Not only huge, they can like start branching. So you can have multiple circles all over the place, and you cannot disable anything, and you cannot update anything. It's like, it's a hell. So we are trying to solve those problems, and uh, two ideas to solve those problems are, well, first idea is try to break the dependency whenever possible. So uh, if you're using, going to use body, uh, you're going to create field article body and field listing body, and OK, it's, it's, it's a bad idea. You're going to end up with a lot of database fields, tables. And also, well, it's ugly. <laughs> So second, second solution is to do the opposite, uh, to actually um, have every single field as a uh, um, feature itself. And then to create, so those are field bases. And then to, to create field instances for nodes. And you would end up with, with this kind of relationship. Who uses this as a concept? OK, it's, it's, it's pretty OK. So we got used to it, and yeah, so it's, it's not a problem. So you can build on top of this. So you can add, for example, views. And as long as you keep your dependencies unidirectional, it's, it's fine, and you're going to be happy. So we are tempted to forget this dark magic, because there is a new kid in town, and his name is configuration management. Now, uh, who was in this morning's uh, uh, keynote? Yeah. So, 
CMI is a bad name, but we kind of it got kind of got stuck. CMI is uh, configuration management initiative, and but now the features features name is like CMI and yeah. So configuration management is actually awesome thing. It is in the core and it allows. Uh, the core to to maintain the config, uh, configuration without without any problems. Um, who used CMI? Okay, a lot of people. So I, I went to know something. Who developed like production ready uh, Drupal 8 websites here? Awesome, quite a bit of people. So um, CMI allows really familiar workflow, and this workflow is. You make your changes in the UI. Those changes are going to be uh, in the database. Then you're going to export those changes to, into YAML files in your Denver environment. You're going to commit them. You're going to push them, whatever, pull them in, in destination server, let's say live. I made an error here, <laughs> OK? And in live YAML files, you just uh, import them into database, and it just works. You have Fantastic UI for that, but we all use Drush. So Drush config export or CEX, uh, you're going to use it just to, to move all the, all the uh, config into files. And then uh, Drush CIM to move all the uh, config from files to the, to the database. And it really works, and it's, it's beautiful. Um, so the question is, well, this is my experience with it. So uh, config is by default exported in some obscure directory in files folder. And I don't like it. I don't like it because it's in files folder, so it's not settings folder or config folder. But also files folder by default is excluded from, from uh, uh, Git. And I don't want that. I want my files to be out of the Git, but config to be in the Git. I mean, you can solve it in, in git ignore, but maybe it's better to, to just move the entire config thing somewhere else. Why isn't it in Drupal core by default like that? Well, probably, uh, well, when you're exporting config, you expect them to export them in the directory that is going to be writable by default, and that's the only files folder. So there is a setting for that. In uh, settings PHP around the end of the, on the, of the, uh, file, there is this config directory sync, and you can just change it to, to something else and export, and it is going to be yeah, exported without a fuss. Who does that? Awesome. Another problem is the fact that you know all the config is in one folder. So I like it to be a little bit more categorized using file uh, folders, but OK, it is what it is. Still, config export created for us HD access uh, file that makes sure that all the configuration is not uh, readable from, from the web server, which is awesome. Uh, it doesn't work with Nginx, so who uses Nginx needs to care, take care of that. Uh, so this actually changed a lot. Uh, well, changed a lot, or helped us with you know, deployment, debugging, maintenance. Now, it is easy. To make deployable software because it is in the core, you can easily debug it because you don't have to search for those obscure settings somewhere in the UI. And of course, because it is Git, you can always know who to blame when something is wrong. And of course, if you want to maintain something really fast, you can just find it in, in uh, uh, well, IDE and Make the change, commit, push. You don't have to hunt the setting in, in config or in admin interface. And of course, there is a problem of people who like to do stuff in live server. OK, so we, we started using this, this fantastic CMI thing. And it works beautifully. But there are developers who like to change settings in live. So how to solve that problem? First idea is, OK, somebody changed something in live. You can see in UI that something is changed. You can export settings from live server and move it to the dev server, like backwards, and, and make sure that all things are synced. 
you can also uh, run Drush config merge, which is part of uh, this Drush plugin. Is it plugin? Config extra. Uh, and it actually does a lot of black magic. So it, it uh, pulls the config from the live server. It does some sort of merging using Git. And finally, you'll end up with, uh, with merged changes from, from local environment and, uh, and uh, remote environment. Who tried this? N somehow. OK, uh, I haven't tried it. I read it while I was preparing for this session, and I was amazed. But then again, I'm really scared because I don't have control over the thing. So I don't know what does it do. I'm going to try it. Uh, my current best practice, or good practice, or at least a practice, is just to block changes in live server. Who, who does that? Yeah. <laughs> so there is this module for Drupal 8 called config read only, and it actually solves, solves our problems. Uh, you can just block all the config changes in, in uh, dev, um, in live. Uh, I, I will give a shot to this Drush thing, but, but currently this is the, the thing to, to use. So uh, I won't deal with, with all the low-level stuff here. This is a high-level session. Uh, but who wants to know more about config deployment? This is the, the place uh, to, to uh, well, <laughs> take a look at it. So uh, Mo Schweizman and uh, Matt Cheney did great presentation of config uh, deployment. So take a look at it. That's our first problem. So config deployment is kind of uh, fixed. Next thing we had in Drupal 7 world were installation profiles. Now, who uses installation profile workflow? OK, it's a it's, it's good, good workflow. So basically, uh, the idea is you want to do all the testing and all the dummy content thing and all the dummy settings thing in your local environment, but, but you don't want to then waste time cleaning that up and, and pushing it to the, to the live clean. So instead, what you want to do is to create an installation profile and rerun several iterations of reinstallations of, of everything in your local environment, make sure that installation profile works, and but also to clean up all the mess you created during development. And it's actually pretty OK, pretty decent workflow. Uh, however, Drupal 8 introduced something else. Now you could just simply do your settings in your local environment. When you're done, you could just push, push to live everything, including your config files. In live, you would install minimal Drupal, which is totally OK. And then you would import your configuration. And it works. It works beautiful. And uh, it is the same workflow as the one I previously uh, described. So it's, it's OK. It's, it's easy to learn. It's easy to, to, to figure out. It works perfectly. Um, however, in a complicated website, it can get a little bit messy. Let's imagine you have like 300 websites or more websites, all um, coming from the same source, but each one has, has some tiny little variation. Uh, that can be like disable blog on this site, enable gallery on that side, or just change the way gallery is presented or something. I don't care. Small variations, but also some some sites are being disabled, like or or created for for a special event, and because I'm working for this political party, like elections are a really special event for them. So okay, we have a site for elections. Elections are done. We have to kill the site. So it's really really uh, um, yeah, short turnaround. But because I am actually working for a political party, they change their specifications a lot. So that's another problem. So this is actually a real world example uh, where we have to maintain, uh, well, currently there is 300 websites, but there are going to be more, uh, all really similar, and the team is not that big. So 
What we actually uh, want to achieve with Drupal 8 is to have installation profile that will allow us to really fast deploy uh, websites and you know just make some changes during this deployment. So for that, installation profile is still a good option. Uh, yeah. So installation profiles are not longer a development tool or are not longer uh, something you would use regularly and for every project, but they're useful when you want to have this kind of stuff to create sites based on existing recipes and then just manipulate with that. And in order to create an installation profile, well, it's, it's really easy to make the switch from, from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. Uh, you know, the difference is minimal. <laughs> so uh, location for the profile is the same. Uh, with the only difference that in Drupal 7 you had core profiles together with, with contrib and custom profiles, and core Drupal profiles in D8 are in slash core slash profiles, but everything else is the same. Uh, info files became info YAML files. They kept, kept the same structure, only different, different well, syntax. Uh, my profile or profile install files and install files, they're really same. Uh, everything we kept in feature, oh. everything we kept in features are now uh, part of config slash install folder. And those are actually the same files that are being exported uh, with CMI. Uh, teams, uh, modules are the same, teams are the same. So it's really the same. And when we compare uh, info files, everything is the same. So uh, you just don't need features and, well, syntax is a little bit different. And this is kind of the structure of one installation profile. So this is really an important concept. Uh, there is this config install folder, and within there are like YAML files. And those files are the same YAML files like in, in um, exported config. So the real question is, can I like export config for my existing site and paste it into installation profile and will it work? Did anybody try that? <laughs> yeah. it, it didn't work. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this was built to move settings from one side to another, not, not to create this kind of atrocity. Okay, I was young and reckless. I even tried, like, when, when I made this work with deleting of some YAML files and everything, I, I even tried, like, uh, creating subdirectories in config slash install and just trying to make, make stuff a little bit more organized. It didn't work. Don't try it. So, if you want to make your config a little bit more organized, to have, like, a directory saying, okay, this is going to be a blog and then all the config within, you're going to have to use good old features. Now, <laughs> features are totally rewritten. And in Drupal 7 world, features were used actually to, to be CM without I. And now features are like using core CMI to only bundle configuration into various bundles. So they are much less heavy, they are like really, really useful. They allow uh, us to export settings, import settings, but also detect changes in, in settings. Why? No, this is, this is really important concept because uh, Drupal CMI, oh, okay, <laughs> 10 minutes. Okay, I have to be fast. Uh, so Drupal CMI exports the settings in um, uh, in actual uh, well modules. Those modules have their own config slash in, uh, uh, install uh, directories with YAML files. So that that all works. Um, features also auto packs various uh, various stuff uh, or or 
when you create a node, it uh, creates kind of a recipe how content type, how to uh, bundle that content type into, into this uh, feature automatically. So it just works. Uh, also, uh, you now have uh, this ability to uh, put the feature into a namespace, which allows us to create a feature called blog or feature with the same name as a module's name, which is awesome. And finally, uh, features is really a dev module because you don't need it in live server. And this is great. And finally, when you disable, well, yeah, uh, dependencies or circular dependencies can still be made. But you can easily disable a feature without losing content because all the settings you created with the feature will stay on the site even after the disabling feature. And that's, that's really awesome. Uh, so my final part of this uh, presentation is Drupal Unsuck, which is actually, um, well, who uses Unsuck expression here? Nobody. Okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> this is embarrassing. Drupal 7 sucks by default. Sucks by default because it has overlay, because it has toolbar. So, this entire procedure of disabling overlay in Drupal uh, toolbar and enabling admin menu, which is like normal thing, uh, and module filter and jQuery update is called unsuck. Now, now uh, there are people who are like expanding this with uh, C tools, views, and libraries. All the stuff that is built in Drupal 8. So Drupal 8 just doesn't suck by default. Well, the only thing that kind of could be better is this toolbar. So we have this admin toolbar menu, uh, toolbar module, which just allows drop-down stuff to to toolbar. So it's it's really it, it doesn't suck. So did I forget something? What sucks? Nothing. OK. <laughs> OK, so generally, we need, you know, with, with this entire versioning system, we now have the opportunity to change Drupal, to uh, introduce drastic Drupal changes, well, core changes, uh, while, uh, while being on this one major Drupal 8 version. So that's, that's, that's really awesome. So, it, and it allows us to introduce new practices and new stuff in existing uh, thing without waiting for new core, which is going to happen in like 10 years, 20 years, I don't know. So um, the idea is of this entire process is to question current practices and re refine them. Uh, you know, if you have a good idea, document it and then time test it. So if it is going to be a good idea for next two, three, four projects, Talk about those ideas. Go to these these sessions and you know talk, and let others question, test, and refine your ideas. And that is a process. That is like good practices or best practices are going to born like that, be born like this. So uh, we have ideas that are becoming good good practices when you give them some time and you know you you practice them. You you try you try to perfect them. When you share them to people, to wide range of people, it is going to become you know, widely accepted as a best practices. And only the best of these best practices will one day become standards. Thank you. Uh, do you have time for questions? Yep, yep perfect. Questions? So, you're going to do 300 websites, and you're going to use the same configuration for them all. And I was thinking you have 300 exactly the same websites. There must be some variation. That's why we are not exporting. No, no, that's why we are not exporting configuration, old configuration. That's why we are building installation profiles. That allows us to, to make those discrete variations. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to bother with installation profiles. There's an API for that. <laughs> oh, it's 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 relatively easy. You can you can do that in dot profile file. Uh, 
currently, currently, yes. Currently, yes, and that's bad. Uh, but generally, the idea is to create UI for that. But we are not that. Yeah, we are not there currently. Yeah. Well, it, uh, yeah, but you can do that relatively easy. Uh, you know, APIs are there, so. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you. Rotten Tomatoes, questions? Uh, well, nothing really. Nothing really, because that's low, like that's that's the thing why we are using features now. We don't have any other reasons. Well, um, this uh, Barcelona presentation actually suggested several things, but they're all like bottled up to the, you know. Well, I actually had the same question, and the answer is ugly. You don't. You just ignore the problem. <laughs> because, okay, so uh, we, we got, uh, well, got used to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, I mean, okay, the idea is best practices, current best practices are not really the best practices. Uh, and we are, all, we are all pretty much sucking it. Me included, even though I'm like holding the session. So the idea is we don't really know. So I had the same problem, and then I decided just to to ignore this entire blog thing. Uh, or, or maybe you could just yeah.
Is it the default content or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> I never tried it, so I don't have any practices regarding that. <laughs> That's your session. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Okay, guys, before you leave, I want to, to make a selfie with you all. <laughs> so, say cheese. cheese. <laughs> Thank you.